In a broad sense, do you believe free speech is on the march or under siege? I think it's under siege, but there's a fight back, uh, and it's the fight back's got a lot to be said for it. Mm. Why under siege, and who is coming for free speech? I think that we've got to look at this in a long historical perspective. Um, tolerance doesn't come naturally to people. Uh, so free speech isn't, uh, isn't, so to speak, the, it's not the default position. What we did about 400 years ago was to develop this amazing culture uh, in which we recognized that the ways we make decisions are a lot more important than any particular decision we might make. You have to accept in a democracy uh, or even in, a, um, uh, in, in any kind of political society that uh, sometimes you, you lose. Sometimes you don't get your own way. Uh, and uh, the essence of modern democratic civilization is that you basically accept that. You go on campaigning for your point of view, uh, but you accept that the system may sometimes be against you. Now, that requires a good deal of tolerance, uh, of, of dissenting views. Uh, it requires a process of discourse in which you can exchange ideas and test them uh, freely. F uh, free speech is absolutely fundamental to that culture. And what we're doing now is that there are lots of people who would like to revert to the kind of situation you had before the 17th century, at the time of religious conflict and so mm. on, when people's views were a matter of authority, you, you did what you were told, you thought what you were told, and this is a really serious retrograde development. Mm. Uh, so you, I just want to go back, you say 400 years ago we decided to put, if you like, principle before pragmatism. Uh, I would uh, say pragmatism before, um, b before despotism. Okay, pragmatism before despotism. Can, can you point to an event where that, where that happened? Where did no, that happen? It's a very in gradual gen process. Uh, people, uh, people abandoned the idea that, for example, uh, our view about the world uh, was a matter on which we should take orders from the ruler. They basically accepted that ideas uh, should be freely floated and should be tested against reality by people who take a different view. Mm. Um, where did this happen? Did it happen in the Western Hemisphere? It happened in Europe over a period, I would say, between the middle of the 17th century uh, and the See, end, I'm gonna come the back end of the 18th century. So this is a Eurocentric view of history and, and freedom of speech. It is yeah. a Western concept. Well, it was a concept uh, that originated uh, in Europe. That's absolutely true. But it's a universal concept. Is it? it? it or is it that just because Europe has colonized the rest of the world intellectually uh, no. and, you know, in a mercantile sense? Uh, a, a, an idea is a good idea or a bad idea, regardless of where it was born. Okay, so your argument is this universal truth of freedom of speech and the goodness of it 400 years ago uh, um, uh, emerges in Europe and spreads incrementally to the rest of the known world. To most of it, that's certainly true. Mm. I mean, just to take one example, um, once upon a time, uh, it was the, the conventional view was that the sun went round the earth and not the other way around. Mm. Now, uh, if the sun goes round the earth, that's just as true uh, in Western Europe as it is in New Zealand or China. Yeah. Uh, now, why did we change our mind about the way the sun moves or the, the earth yeah. moves? We changed our mind because people uh, did observations, they argued the point, and ultimately the outcome of that argument was that the, the truth prevailed. That's the best way of discovering the truth about the natural world, about the moral world, about most things. Mm. All right. So freedom of speech and therefore the pursuit of truth, we decide is a good thing. Is there anywhere in the world it didn't reach in the last 400 years that's never even got the message? Who had the phone off the hook? <laughs> There's nobody who's ignorant of the, uh, of the concept, concept. Mm. Uh, but there are plenty of places where the concept isn't practiced, and in some of them it never has been. Um, I mean, Russia has been a, uh, uh, a, a controlling autocracy throughout its history. Um, but what we're seeing now is not at all untypical of what it's been like in Russia now for many centuries. Mm. Uh, so they didn't have the phone off the hook. Uh, they just didn't listen to what was coming, the sounds that were coming down it. Mm. All right.
So some places haven't had it. But you say it's such a good idea, it's spread. I, I, I put it to you that we have in the last 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, in terms of technology, our ability to communicate with each other, to express our free will, to express our opinions. The individual now has more power to connect, to reach people than ever before in human history. That's true. And one might have thought that would lead to, if you like, a storm of freedom and truth and interaction. I'm not sure that it has, because as you say, free speech is under siege. Mm. At a time when we have the tools for it to absolutely be on the march, to become universal. Yes, it's the results uh, of the sheer volume of material which is spewed out every day, every minute, uh, on, on the internet, on the social media and so on. The volume is so huge uh, that we need to have some system for ordering it uh, and bringing Should relevant some bits of to our attention. some of us shut up a bit? So there isn't so much volume. Well, the, the, the difficulty about the social media uh, is that, uh, first of all, they, it has a capacity to create an instant mob. Mm -hmm. uh, that we've, the, yeah. the communication is so effective that you can now do something that would previously have taken weeks. Uh, so that has proved to be a, a, a real source of oppression and coercion. The second thing that is the problem, problematic about social media uh, is that the algorithms which select what's going to be brought to your attention basically confront you with things you already agree with. The, the most you important... You need confirmation bias. Exactly. Out of that, yeah. So, essentially, people uh, can, can, can follow Twitter or X and they never get the opportunity to be presented with a rational view uh, 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 which is different to their own. Mm. They're never challenged, and without challenge, you're never going to get anywhere near the truth. Mm -hmm. We actually advance as a civilization by confronting adverse opinions and not by suppressing yeah, them. Look, and even when we are confronted, as a journalist, get people, well, you haven't got the other side of the story. And I say, there's not just one other story. Stories aren't binary. There are multiple truths and aspects, and you must be prepared and be open to all of them. And as you say, we have algorithms who, uh, if they're going to give us alternative, it's one alternative. It's often very polarised as well, and all over the world. And in little long New Zealand as well, this social media debate has created extremes where we, I don't think they existed before, we occupied a comfortable middle ground. But increasingly now on the left and the right of politics and social thought, we have diametrically opposed views with very little room in the middle for yes. compromise. Uh, I would say that, that New Zealand is better off than many countries in that respect. After all, you have a proportional representation system in your mm. parliament. Mm. Uh, you have uh, a wider range of political parties than we have in the UK, for example, where we have a first-past-the-post system. Uh, I think that the, 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 the world leader uh, in this dismal path downhill is the United States. Um, and uh, they're in a really seriously bad position. Uh, the, the basic problem of so many societies is that we have got used to the idea of continually improving standards of living and these expectations are now being disappointed.